Hello, my name is Hassan Sorrells, and this is the Leadership Lessons from the Great Books podcast, episode number 19, with my guest co-host today, Ryan Jerome Stout. Hello, Ryan. Hello, Hassan. How are you today? It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Yes, it is, indeed. And we are about to go on the road. When we think about books that have made America, particularly America, in the late 20th century, we come to books that have meaning. We come to books that are interesting. We come to books that are relevant. Uh, we've been talking about books such as A Movable Feast and even Slouching Towards Bethlehem. And eventually we're going to also talk about Travels with Charlie. But today we're going to talk about a book from a man who's writing in the 1950s and 1960s set the tone for every travel autobiography you ever heard of afterward. And I quote directly from On the Road by Jack Kerouac. Chad had decided not to be Dean's friend anymore for some odd reason, and he didn't even know where he lived. Is Carlo Marx in town? Yes, but he wasn't talking to him anymore either. This was the beginning of Chad King's withdrawal from our general gang. I was to take a nap in his house that afternoon. The word was that Tim Gray had an apartment waiting for me up on Colfax Avenue, that Roland Major was already living in it and was waiting for me to join him. I sensed some kind of conspiracy in the air, and this conspiracy lined up two groups in the gang. It was Chad King and Tim Gray and Roland Major, together with the Rollinses, generally agreeing to ignore Dean Moriarty, and Carlo Marx. I was smack in the middle of this interesting war. It was a war with social overtones. Dean was the son of a wino, one of the most tottering bums on Larimer Street, and Dean had, in fact, been brought up generally on Larimer Street and thereabouts. He used to plead in court at the age of six to have his father set free. He used to beg in front of the Larimer alleys and sneak the money back to his father, who waited among the broken bottles with an old buddy. Then, when Dean grew up, he began hanging around the Glenarm pool halls. He set a Denver record for stealing cars and went to the reformatory. From the age of 11 to 17, he was usually in reform school. His specialty was stealing cars, gunning for girls, coming out of high school in the afternoon, driving them out to the mountains, making them, and coming back to sleep in any available hotel bathtub in town. His father, once a respectable and hardworking tinsmith, had become a wine alcoholic, which is worse than a whiskey alcoholic, and was reduced to riding freights to Texas in the winter and back to Denver in the summer. Dean had brothers on his dead mother's side. She died when he was small, but they disliked him. Dean's only buddies were the pool hall boys. Dean, who had the tremendous energy of a new kind of American saint, and Carlo were the underground monsters of that season in Denver together with the pool hall gang. And symbolizing this most beautifully, Carlo had a basement apartment on Grant Street, and we all met there many a night that went to dawn. Carlo, Dean, myself, Tom Snark, Ed Dunkel, and Roy Johnston more of these others uh, later. As I mentioned right there at the open, On the Road is the penultimate template for the 20th century travel biography. Now, don't get me wrong, there's been travel biographies ever since man, and it is men mostly, uh, started walking around and started writing down what they were seeing. Uh, all the way from Xenophon to Edith Wharton. And by the way, Edith Wharton is not a woman. But anyway, but the best of them all, <laughs> the best of these travel biographies is the standard by which all incisive, self-aware, and quote-unquote truthful, even if they're lying, memoirs that were ever published in the course of the long, drawn-out, and existentially illustrative 20th century. In 1955, Jack Kerouac was published for the second, or maybe it was third time, and that book was On the Road. Kerouac was born 
to French Canadian parents. He grew up speaking French, interestingly enough. Uh, he wrote books, several, uh, many of which were unpublished during his lifetime. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, he drank like a fish, tragically, and died from complications involving heavy alcohol use. Kerouac's approach to writing has become part and parcel of the general stereotype surrounding a particular method of writing, a particular way of seeing the world and dealing with its existential horror. And, speaking of horror, the horror writer, Stephen King, addressed the perniciousness of that stereotype in his great writing memoir, of which I have the first edition. Some of you may have the <laughs> second or third one. <laughs> I believe Ryan has the second or third one, uh, entitled On Writing. And I will quote extensively from On Writing here. I also employed, King speaking of himself, I also employed the world famous Hemingway defense. Uh, note, we just read Hemingway on the podcast. You might want to go back and check that one out. Although never clearly articulated, it would not be manly to do so. The Hemingway defense goes something like this. As a writer, I'm a very sensitive fellow, but I'm also a man, and real men don't give in to their sensitivities. Only sissy men do that. Therefore, I drink. How else can I face the existential horror of it all, continue to work? Besides, come on, I can handle it. A real man always can. And, quote, The idea that creative endeavor and mind-altering substances are entwined is one of those great pop-cultural intellectual myths of our time. The four 20th century writers whose work is most responsible for it are probably Hemingway, Fitzgerald, Sherwood Anderson, and the poet, Dylan Thomas. They are the writers who largely formed our vision of an existential English-speaking wasteland where people have been cut off from one another and lived in an atmosphere of, an emotional, of emotional strangulation and despair. These concepts are very familiar to most alcoholics. The common reaction to them is amusement. Substance abusing writers are just substance abusers. Common garden variety drunks and druggies, in other words. Any claims that the drugs and alcohol are necessary to dull a finer sensibility are just the usual self-serving bullshit. I've heard alcoholic snowplow drivers make the same claim that they drink to still the demons. It doesn't matter if you're James Jones, John Cheever, or Stubum snoozing in Penn Station for an addict the right to the drink or drug of choice must be preserved at all costs. Hemingway and Fitzgerald didn't drink because they were creative, alienated, or morally weak. They drank because it's what alkies are wired to do. Creative people probably do run a greater risk of alcoholism and addiction than those in some other jobs. But so what? We all look pretty much the same when we're puking in the gutter. Close quote from Stephen King. Now, this is from the author who wrote the book Tommy Knockers with cotton balls stuck up his nose to stop the bleeding from cocaine use in the 1980s. I would add Jack Kerouac to that list of folks that King mentioned in that excerpt. I would also add that this myth or stereotype, if you will, extends to other creative areas, most notably music and even writing in the nonfiction travel essay memoir space. All of which may reveal something, a kernel of truth, and it may serve to expose or dig up something, maybe, for leaders in this podcast episode today. So we're going to start with discovering something about Kerouac with my guest today, published poet, a musician, Ironically enough, a bartender come lately and a long time, 20 year long personal friend of mine, Ryan Jerome Stout. Thank you for that. It was a long intro. Beautiful, beautiful intro. Beautiful intro. Um, Long intro. So. And I, I, I do love the inclusion of Stephen King speaking in that way. To accurately, you know, he he would know. So it's from a, a voice and a writer that has the experience of it. Um, but tell us a little bit about yourself, because I, I I know that there are some folks who may have seen your podcast interview with me on the Hayson Sorrell's Audio Experience, the other podcast that I run. Um, but these audiences don't always cross over, so. 
why don't you take a few moments and kind of lay it on the line for folks who are listening to the leadership lessons from the great books, all those managers and supervisors out there who, uh, who might be interested to get to know you. Absolutely. Thank you for the, uh, the steering the ship. <laughs> you know me well. I do, 20, I do know you well. 20 years. So um, <laughs> 20 plus. So yeah, Ryan Jerome Stout from Trenton, New Jersey, born in 1978. Um, you know, I don't think it's a coincidence that uh, Hassan asked me uh, for this particular book uh, because of the the, the the drinking and the, the substance and and, and uh, my history is, is it was fairly extensive um, and you know I played baseball and I kind of equated it to um, it was a creative person who was also an athlete and a high level athlete and, and a, a scholarship uh, academic and athletic scholarship to go to college and you know, I often said that I was uh, a drunk who just happened to be really good at baseball. So it's you could supplant that with the comments mm -hmm. that uh, the quote from from um, Stephen King. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the <clears throat> you know going through that period of it, for me, it's. Well, it was all about uh, searching. And I do believe that, you know, when Carl Jung and, um, and uh, Bill Wilson, the quote unquote founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, they were in deep correspondence and, you know, the, the spiritual malady and, you know, that we are, we are spiritual beings having a physical experience. And mm -hmm. that seems to resonate with, at least with my, you know, alcoholic and, and drug addict mind, because otherwise things fail to make good sense and i don't know if there is uh i don't think it's conflicting and you know my favorite uh writer is albert camus and he, you know he often gets uh miscal uh, miscategorized as an existentialist uh and uh with um uh, Sartre, but uh you know he's you know i like when he comments on you know i am an absurdist and by his definition you know the absurd is trying to make sense of this completely uh, absurd world. When you when you're in that place and you're in that, you know, in that on that hamster wheel and you don't understand why things are going the way they are, it's, mm -hmm. that's it. That's that is the sort of the epitome of the absurd. Well, and it's interesting because we've had on this podcast we've had lawyers and intellectuals. We've had academics as co-hosts. We've had clinical psychologists, <laughs> trained clinical therapeutic psychologists. Uh, come on, talk to us about Dostoevsky. <laughs> you know, going to break down that heavy book. Um, but we've never had someone who is as... Th th those individuals can read the material and they can filter it and they do. And that's why we have one. They filter that material through their lived experience and their lived experiences in the professional realm. Um, and their lived experience very often in the weight of the world. And this is why I wanted to, another reason why I wanted to bring you on for the book. Um, because in the weight of the world, their lived experience is often given more weight when you're talking about heavy literature. Whereas you look at something like Kerouac, and Kerouac is often, and I'm going to make this point later on in the podcast as well, in this episode today as well. Kerouac is often lumped in with, you know, Ginsburg, um, He's often lumped in with um, with Burroughs, and he's put in with those three guys, and then he's sort of shuffled off. And just as annoying, I think, as Fitzgerald would find, F. Scott Fitzgerald would find it to realize that The Great Gatsby is being read by high school students who don't understand it, because that's not who he wrote it for. I think Kerouac, too, would be annoyed <laughs> that high school students are reading his book and not getting anything out of it. And I, I'm not, that's not to say that, that some 18 year old somewhere can't get something out of Kerouac. I'm not making that claim. I'm making the claim that the weight of his contribution to American literature and American arts based on his background and his, and I want to go back to this idea of, of absurdity of his making sense out of the absurd or his attempt to in an American context is not given nearly the amount of weight that I think he would want it to be given and want it to be provided. 
Um, which leads me to the question, the core question at the beginning here. What can leaders, and when we think about leaders, that's an interesting noun, what can leaders in all spaces, Ryan, take from, and you read the book recently, you recently burned through it for a, for the head of the podcast, so you're, you're supporting the show, uh, <laughs> more than just being on your support in the show. So you've read the whole, you read the whole thing, not just the clips that we are going to read. And by the way, folks, we don't read the whole book. Like, I want to reiterate this again. You know, we're, we're now you know, 50 some odd episodes into this podcast, we don't read the whole book. We read excerpts so that you can go out and get something of value from those excerpts and go, hey, I'm going to go read the book now. Uh, so we will be looking at part one and part two primarily today of On the Road. Um, Ryan has read all of it. Um, I have read all of it. What can we take from Kerouac's writing and On the Road that leaders can apply to their their actual practical lived lives? So... I think in a text message I sent to you, mm -hmm. the difference between, because I was one of those people who read it at the age of probably 19 or 20, mm -hmm. and then recently flying through it in a completely different lens. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, this sounds circuitous. However, I think it uh, will add to the question of, of, of my explanation of what leaders can take from it. So as a 19 year old, when I read uh, On the Road by Jack Kerouac, it felt like it was what I was supposed to do because of the lifestyle that I was drawn to. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think how Kerouac describes that sort of the uh, 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 the ex existential crisis and and how I think as technology has made its you know advancements, the ages of people coming to face to face with that or at least having some sort of a uh, acknowledgement of it um, has uh, you know I think babies begins younger and younger so. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's 19, 20 years old. I started drinking 15, 16 years old, 15 years old and doing drugs at 16 years old pretty heavily and um, got a academic and baseball scholarship, went away to college and all of the things that I was doing as far as social, all of the criteria that uh, the DSM uh, five cites as uh, benchmarks for uh, alcoholism Mm -hmm. and, and the quote unquote disease that's another debate but so those things uh had not taken hold yet and so it was before kind of my cellular existence was uh creating to a degree uh the substances that it needed in order to kind of continue so um i thought i felt obligated to partake in the lifestyle of the uh, Kerouac and Beats and, and, and Burroughs and that sort of thing. And um, it, you know, it was like a rite of passage. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, my friends who started at a very young age as well, who were, you know, uh, voracious readers and, and that sort of thing. So at the time, I'm only attaching to him and picking up on, wow, this guy is doing everything drunk. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, hey, Son will tell you that there was, you know, even even times when, uh, you know, it was kind of like always peppered on something. There was always something kind of coursing through my veins. And uh, and uh, and so it was almost a, uh, a, a an outline or a blueprint of how to do things. However, I I feel and, and this is the enormous distinction. Jack Kerouac had a goal, an idea, and he was on this exploration and had an outline. Mm -hmm. And his outline, there was lots of room for freedom. However, the moment that he goes north uh, on the first leg of his trip to go west, mm -hmm. I mean, he is, he travels for an entire day and he's like two hours from his house. Yeah. <laughs> and he's going, I'm almost out of money yeah. and this and that. So it's the, you know, it is the fearlessness mm -hmm. of that and it's sticking to. And um, 
I don't think it was a crazy idea for at the time for people to go cross country and explore. I really don't. I think it is a matter of intent. Yeah. So, okay, yeah. it's the East Coast, work is hard, let's go out west, blah, 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 that sort of thing. No, this guy was like, I want to see, I want to see how the country is living. And, mm -hmm. and so there was this exploratory, infra, like he, Kerouac, if you read it, and from his perspective, mm -hmm. he is never from the perspective, anyway, not the core of his searching mm -hmm. is a student of life and get to the, the, the body. Like I want to understand, mm -hmm. I want more information to understand. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think at a 19 year old, I don't think I was, I know there are, like you said, there are, you know, mm -hmm. younger people who are beyond their years. As a 19 year old, I was not, I may have thought probably like many things right now where I think, and it's not uh, that that was um, something that I was doing. And I was in, my intent was seeking for a better under or greater understanding of something. Uh, but it wasn't until years later. And so now that's 19. And now here, this is like, the, the synchronicity of that is like, well, it's years later and, and, and right. now I read it again and it's a, it's a different thing. And I, you know, at a young age, I learned that I should probably not listen to anything that comes out of my father's mouth. But I remember at one point, mm -hmm. and I may have started reading on the road when I was 16, when a friend gave it to me. And then I didn't read it again in full until I went away to college and, uh, uh, several years later, but I remember my father seeing it and I was like, Hey, you know, what do you think of this book? And, uh, it's really, really interesting what he said. I looked up, uh, the other day, I just kind of like, uh, searched on the road and book reviews and this and that. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so there was, a. it seemed that the, uh, literary, uh, academia, uh, uh, and the media, there was like two sides. It's like, wow, mm -hmm. this is evolutionary. Uh, this is uh, making a statement for uh, the, the literary uh, um, perspective of, of how you can write or what you can write to come. And it was this, this sort of refreshing, enlightening thing. It's just like the new school versus the old school. Yeah. And uh, it makes so much sense that my father is the old school because I read the old school paragraph of mm -hmm. what, and I was like, holy shit. It's exactly, <laughs> my father said it was, uh, the book was uh, crap. The media blew it out of proportion. It was a stunt and it was only used in order to propel book sales as if it didn't really happen. Like it was a Milli Vanilli type situation. You know what I mean? It was just yeah. sort of like facade. Right. And which is really beautiful how Kerouac ties jazz music mm -hmm. into that. So it, it still remained such uh, an interesting and like uh, aberrant perspective. It just like, like, yes, jazz, d d d like there's, yeah. there's a parallel there, but it yeah. will never be at the forefront of, because it does not. Of culture, be, right. Because yeah. at the core of it, he says, to get a cross section or a slice of the middle class or middle America or, you know, and so the irony that middle America, quote unquote, my father falling into that from the mm -hmm. old school mm -hmm. feels that way about that. And, and so it, it only further supports <laughs> yeah. the, 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 what Kerouac was trying to trying illustrate. To accomplish. Yeah. And so what the, 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 the leadership lesson to take away from all of that is You know, uh, uh, this is a conversation I've been having several friends. So it's
And this may have something to do with how people were raised, how I was raised, mm-hmm. uh, may have something to do with codependency, parents uh, looking for a father figure. The, the, that sort of uh, existing in that space where eject yourself from the space where you feel the need to validate your opinion, existence, how you're living, and through someone else when it is something that you know you already know. And that right there is at the core of what we've been exploring with these authors that I've been mentioning during the course of this last month or so on the podcast. This idea that leaders can grow in self-awareness and that getting that self-awareness will give them the courage to eject themselves from other people's nonsense. And it is by looking at writers that were underestimated, and we did, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Kerouac's um, writing process today, but that were underestimated or in their time were dismissed and later on were added to a certain pantheon. And we'll talk about the pantheon that Kerouac was added to in just a moment here. But um, leaders can, can at the core by reading this literature, if not necessarily understand, at least connect with the idea that at a certain point, we should probably stop screwing around and just get on the road. Back to the book. The following 10 days were, as W.C. Field said, fraught with eminent peril and mad. I moved in with Roland Major in the really swank apartment that belonged to Tim Gray's folks. We each had a bedroom, and there was a kitchenette uh, with food in the ice box and a huge living room where Major sat in his silk dressing gown, composing his latest Hemingway in short story, a choleric, red-faced, pudgy hater of everything who could turn on the warmest and most charming smile in the world, when real life confronted him sweetly in the night. He sat like that at his desk, and I jumped around over the thick, soft rug wearing only my chino pants. He'd just written a story about a guy who comes to Denver for the first time. His name is Phil. His traveling companion is a mysterious and quiet fellow called Sam. Phil goes out to dig Denver and gets hung up with Artie types. He comes back to the hotel room. Lugubriously, he says, Sam, they're here too. And Sam is just looking out the window sadly. Yes, says Sam, I know. And the point was that Sam didn't have to go and look to know this. The arty types were all over America, sucking up its blood. Major and I were great pals. He thought I was the farthest thing from an arty type. Major liked good wines, just like Hemingway. He reminisced about his recent trip to France. Ah, Sal... You could sit with me high in the Basque country with a cool bottle of Poignon de Nuit. Then you'd know there are other things besides boxcars. Then he has a conversation with uh, Major. And uh, again, we're not reading the whole book, so I'm going to skip ahead a little bit and uh, go to the end of the conversation here where he's talking about Dean um, and uh, unfinished business. Uh, Kerouac says, Dean and I are embarked on a tremendous season together. We're trying to communicate on absolute, with absolute honesty and absolute completeness everything on our minds. This is interesting, folks. We've had to take Benzedrine. We sit on the bed cross-legged facing each other. I have finally taught Dean that he can do anything he wants, become mayor of Denver, marry a millionaireess, or become the greatest poet since Rimbaud. But he keeps rushing out to see the midget auto races. <laughs> and there's the absurdity, by the way. I go with him. He jumps and yells, excited. You know, Sal, Dean is really hung up on things like that, Marx said. Hmm. And his soul had thought about this. What's the schedule, I said. There's always a schedule in Dean's life. The schedule is this. I came off work a half hour ago, and that time Dean is bawling Mary Lou at the hotel and gives me time to change and dress. At one sharp, he rushes for Mary Lou to Camille. Of course, neither one of them knows what's going on and banks her once, giving me time to arrive at one thirty. 
Then he comes out with me. First, he has to beg with Camille, who's already starting to hate me, and we come here to talk till 6 in the morning. We usually spend more time than that, but it's getting awfully complicated, and he's pressed for time. Then at 6, he goes back to Mary Lou, and he's going to spend all day tomorrow running around to get the necessary papers for their divorce. Mary Lou's all for it, but she insists on banging in the interim. She says she loves him. So does Camille. By the way, this is not a book for children. I want to be very clear on this. I, I would not give, unlike Ryan's father, I would not give this book to my 16-year-old. There are adult themes in this book, and there are ideas in here. And it's not just erotic ideas. And it's not just sexual ideas. There are There's drug use in this book. Uh, there's behavior in this book that... If you are a person of sensitive nature, uh, you may find to be offensive. Uh, Kerouac was writing and documenting what he was actually seeing. He wasn't trying to sugarcoat it or put a, a veneer of respectability on top of it, as you would expect if he were a typical writer in the 1950s. But there's things to know about Kerouac that kind of create a counterpoint to what he put in the book. And it creates an interesting dichotomy when you think about who he was as a writer. Writers like Kerouac and Ginsberg and Burroughs set the tone for much of the music and cinema and counterculture in the 1960s. And Kerouac, interestingly enough, would disassociate himself from much of that, uh, for much and for many of the hippies who were to embody <clears throat> many of the concepts that he laid out in On the Road and many of them that Ryan brought up and much later in the book Dharma Bums. Uh, and that makes him a person that's not easy to peg. And for a generation of individuals, specifically I'm thinking of the baby boomers now, uh, looking for identity in a world long before the internet brought teenagers' identities to them with no friction or conflict, Kerouac's book provided a template for how to, you know, get out there, man. Get after it. Now, what you don't really realize, unless you're a person who pays attention to these sorts of things, is that Kerouac identified politically and religiously with the conservative right of the time. Um, <laughs> and uh, right. And, and you go out and you look at that and then you look at what he wrote. And again, this creates dichotomies, right? He even appeared once on Firing Line uh, with that firebrand of <laughs> late 20th century conservatism, William F. Buckley. Yeah, him. that interview, it's on, you can see it on YouTube. It's, you can watch it on YouTube. pretty fascinating. Yeah. yeah, with whom he was roommates with at Columbia before Buckley went on to write, um, oh gosh, the conservative book, uh, something about a man at Yale, or conservative man at Yale, or something, I can't remember the title. All of you out there will remember the title and you'll tell me. But yeah, Buckley was... Uh, Bugley was no slouch himself in the writing department. <laughs> and uh, it's really interesting how Kerouac's Catholicism and his deep sense that there must be order in the universe and that we must somehow pursue this was an interesting counterpoint to what he was seeing and identifying it on the road. Personally, he also smoked pot. He drank liberally, as I already mentioned. And allegedly, we, we have no definitive proof of this, but there are some obviously intimations and on the road that got on the road in trouble. It actually should have probably been published a couple of years earlier than it was because the publisher couldn't figure out how to actually push this across the line to mid the aforementioned middle America. He also may, may have engaged in homosexual behavior uh, with abandon. Kerouac for his cultural moment was outsized. He was a totemic individual for his time uh, and he did write about his individual lived experiences and on the road. Um, now, the tragedy is just like any genuine artist, just like any genuine talent that shows up. Um, the problem was not with Kerouac. The problem was with all the folks after Kerouac who tried to ape what he did and missed the joke. <laughs> uh, and you see this in the French existentialists. I mean, um, Ryan talked about and mentioned Camus and Sartre. Um, and I don't have a problem with those guys. I typically have a problem with the guys who came after them, the Derrida's of the world and all of those folks, uh, even the Michel Foucault's of the world. And we'll cover those guys on the podcast here, maybe a little bit next year. 
Kerouac was pursuing truth. I fundamentally believe that some kind of truth. And I think on the road was a way for him to work through what that truth was. And if you look at his working pattern, uh, he actually journaled <laughs> quite extensively, which is something that we recommend for leaders on this podcast. Um, and you journal to grow in self-awareness. But if you're a writer, you journal to get to the truth, which Stephen King, going back to on writing, has two great quotes right at the beginning of his uh, of his edition of on writing, which I want to I want to quote to you. Uh, if you open up to the front, um, he actually says, and he by the way he does this all the time in his books. He actually says um, the first quote at the front page, the front piece is, "Honesty is the best policy." From Miguel de Cervantes, author of Don Quixote. Okay, but then the second quote, "Liars prosper." Anonymous. <laughs> when we think about truth, when we think about story, I made this point interestingly enough today in thinking about this and in another conversation I was having with somebody else. We want truth to be like facts, and truth is more like narrative. It's more like a story we have to tell, and there's different versions of narrative. And of course, in our time, we are held captive because of our technology by a fatal worship of science and belief that scientific fact is the only fact that matters and fundamentally the only truth that is important. But Kerouac knew, just like Hemingway and Fitzgerald and Stephen King and me and you and even Ryan here, he knew that there's more than one version of truth and there's more than one type of truth that is true. Leaders have to get the truth of their followers. So how do they do that, Ryan? How do they? What would Kerouac say if he was standing up in front of a bunch of middle managers? Well, all although, so you you mentioned all of those, uh, and and and, and uh, so the the. Uh, I'm sorry if the name's escaping me. It's uh, it's the uh, Marx, Marx. Marx, and and so yes. that's Ginsburg. Yes, that's Alan Ginsburg. That's Alan Ginsburg. Yes, and then, yeah, uh, and all this, by the way, the book, all the names are changed to protect the guilty. So, yeah. Carlo Marx is Alan Ginsburg. Um, I, I could run through all of them, but uh, Dean is Neil Cassidy. Yeah. Um, Herbert Hunkel is featured in here. I mean, you know, it's 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 a and, whole uh, the, uh, the entire old, cast old of characters. Bill Lee's, well, old Bill Lee, yeah, and so. Although I do believe of those late night conversations and fueled by uh, dexedrine that uh, used to be snapped and uh, broken into cups of coffee. And, and that's because they had to sort of extract it was a process. And so uh, I believe that uh, how Kerouac, not the essence or the search of truth, but the method of how he communicated because he was, he's the, 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 he is, he, he took on the responsibility as the researcher, narrator, and documentarian. And so whether it was conscious or subconscious or otherwise, or learned, or he knew how he spoke to old Bill Lee, Mm -hmm. or how he conversed with uh, Neil Cassidy. And so, and I'm sure at times they were all having conversation in the same room. However, if there's one thing that's made very clear in uh, this book is how peripatetic everyone was. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they were all over the place. Out, and it was like, and, and one of the fascinating things, and this is kind of the, the you know, uh, the technolo technological advancements is like, it, there were no cell phones like these dudes were meeting up all over the country <laughs> that's right yes. there was no like it was the, you know it, it just doesn't so they were like there weren't even pay letters. phones were they yeah, yeah there was like writing letters and like hey i'll be in you know denver between this and this and so and so would show up at four o'clock in the morning and he'd be like okay and they would just pick up right where they left off um but learning how to communicate with each in individual and there's something uh like coaches coaches mm -hmm. very good coaches uh the best coaches know how to do this mm -hmm. uh 
um, and having lots of sort of managerial experience myself, whether it be in food service or, or whatever, Mm-hmm. Um, it's, there's, there's ways to communicate and, uh, with each, each individual. And so taking the time mm-hmm. to invest, it may be as little as, um, there's someone who is a soccer fan mm-hmm. or there is someone who is an anime fan or there's, so you find out who in the group of the people you'd be leading, you find out what their sort of thing is mm-hmm. and invest a little time in that. And it may seem, uh, I'm sure, a waste of time and energy and you only have X amount of like space in your brain to retain information that you feel is completely irrelevant. Uh, but it's not, it's, it's, I almost equate it with, so how people say it's, it's, it is a, uh, a, a misidentification of what the goal is mm-hmm. and how I equate it with like, um, people who are diehard environmentalists and they speak as if the planet is in danger. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. And so you're missing a, I think you're missing I mean, the, the, the point of wanting to take care of the planet is like you're m- missing the point. If you think it's for the planet, right? Yeah. Okay. It's for, it's for person kind. It's for your, 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 your brother, your sister, your neighbor, your loved ones. It is so, uh, you know, uh, all people, encompassing. Yeah. So the human race can continue or have a shot. Right. It's one of the things that you said, you know, it's like you get through the day at a better, at a shot at tomorrow, right? at a shot at tomorrow. And so um, it's not wasted time. It is not a waste. You're investing. And one of the things that I learned years ago uh, was typically the quality of my life is, uh, you know, the quality of my interpersonal relationships often will dictate the quality of my life. Hmm. And so if your interpersonal relationships, you're investing in them in a way that is not uh, sort of I don't, passe or like, like if, if, you know what, if, uh, Mm-hmm. If one of your employees can't stop talking about ghosts in the shell on the difference between the anime movie yep. from 1994, I think something or, like that, so, yeah, and and the Scarlett uh, Scarlett Johansson, Johansson, version, yeah. You know, the, if, if, if you know, then you know, take take six hours, break yeah. it and look at, and and you know what? So everything is a tool. So when you were talking about truth and, and this and that, it's like my, so the difference between a lot of the people that I would meet and say in Alcoholics Anonymous and mm-hmm. also how Kerouac and how uh, um, King outlines the junking, the junk. Yes. The junk cells and this and that, and there's this, there is this cellular component to it however what was behind a lot of my behavior was exactly what you just said i'm trying to get to the truth of something i want to know why i should want to keep living i want to know why it's important for me to you know invest in my family i want to know why why they care about like it none of it i was completely derailed at a very young age because of a lot of the things that I saw and I saw how people treated each other. Mm -hmm. And so I needed to understand why. And so once I started to, and, you know, I watched into the wild the other day, which is another book, you know, uh, you know, uh, I had a friend who, uh, this is right after the book came out. So, uh, crack hour wrote wrote into Mm -hmm. thin air as well. And Mount Everest. So, This guy I lived with in New Brunswick, he said, hey, I was very reluctant. I'm very reluctant to give this book to you because I feel like it is just a blueprint. 
Hmm. And so just know that when you're reading it. And yeah. so there's two things that are happening. Or that's wow, that's incredibly flattering. And it's like, oh, you think I'm just on this path of. And so at the point of where Chris McCandless is like, oh, it's and he's look, he's reading uh, Tolstoy, mm-hmm. and it's like, oh, wait, it's joy, yes, freedom, but you're missing just like the saving the earth. You're missing the peace yeah. because it's meant to be shared with other people, right? And so we are meant to be in relationship with each other. I, I you know, that's a fundamental thing. And uh, we'll get back to care. I just a second here. That's a fundamental thing that. Well, you know, we're a podcast of our time. We're, we're produced podcast, but we're a podcast of our time. And in this time in which we are in right now, um, it is incumbent on all of us to build relationships with each other. And I'm not talking about social media based relationships. I'm not talking about your 600 friends, quote unquote, on Facebook. Analog. You, yeah, exactly. Analog. I, I know. I know. I I always think of the joke from the Big Lebowski. Anyway, if you know what that movie is, you'll know what the joke is. If you don't, go back and look at it. <laughs> um, but um, <laughs> but everything is not digital. Some things can be done analog. Uh, <laughs> and only remain pleasurable in the analog. And one of those things that only remains pleasurable in the analog, even though Ryan and I are separated by uh, about eight hours and uh, a couple of different time zones. The thing that remains analog are the relationships that you have with other people. And in times when shortages and um, riots and um, real genuine human need may be revisiting America, and that's part of the reason why I do this podcast, but in real genuine human need may be revisiting America, the thing that gets people through times of genuine need that we haven't seen in this country in probably close to a hundred years. The thing that's going to get us through all that is going to be relationships. It's going to be relationships with other people. If you're listening to this podcast and you're a manager or a leader, you have to know your people because you may be the only neighbor that they have. You may be the only neighbor that they know. And Ryan's right. Look, I have an opinion about Ghost in the Shell. I have an opinion about (laughs) Akira. And it doesn't matter if I'm leading my people. My opinion is irrelevant. What matters is me knowing what they think about it. Me caring enough to sit down for six hours and watch the movie from the 1990s, the animated film, which I have seen, and watch the Scarlett Johansson film, which was widely panned, which I did not see. I have a responsibility to do that because I have to be curious about the people I'm leading in the same way that Kerouac was curious about, well, about learning who America was, about getting out on the road. By the way, this takes a measure of courage. And so back to the book. Carlo's basement apartment was on Grant Street in an old red brick rooming house near a church. You went down an alley, down some stone steps, opened an old raw door, and went through a kind of cellar until you came to his board door. It was the, it was like the room of a Russian saint. One bed, a candle burning, stone walls that oozed moisture, and a crazy makeshift icon, I-K-O-N, of some kind that he had made. He read me his poetry. It was called Denver Doldrums. Carlo woke up in the morning and heard the vulgar pigeons yakking in the street outside his cell. He saw the sad nightingales nodding on the branches, and they reminded him of his mother. A gray shroud fell over the city. The mountains, the magnificent Rockies, you can see to the west from any part of town were paper mache. By the way, he's in Denver at this point. The whole universe was crazy and cockeyed and extremely strange. He wrote of Dean as a quote-unquote child of the rainbow who bore his torment in his agonized Priapus. <laughs> he referred to him as Oedipus Eddie, who had to, quote, scrape bubblegum off window panes, unquote. He brooded in his basement over a huge journal in which he was keeping track of everything that happened every day. Everything that Dean did or said. Dean came on schedule. Everything straight, he announced. I'm going to divorce Mary Lou and Mary Camille and go live with her in San Francisco. But this is only after you and I, dear Carlo, go to Texas. Dig old Bill Lee, that gone cat I've never met and both of you have told me so much about, and then I'll go to San Fran. By the way, this is to Ryan's point. 
they were making plans all over the country. Oh, you didn't call me. Oh, well, I didn't have a chance to meet you. Oh, I didn't pick up that letter. Oh, well, I'm out living my life. And they did that thing. Um, I remember having to set times to go to a party using a payphone. You may be part of the generation that's listening to this who has no idea what I'm talking about because if your friends blow you off, you just go on Instagram and find more. And I get it that people have options, but these people had options too. And their options were just as valid as ours. Back to the book. Then they got down to business. They sat on the bed cross-legged and looked straight at each other. I slouched in a nearby chair and saw all of it. They began with an abstract thought, discussed it, reminded each other of another abstract point forgotten in the rush of events. Dean apologized but promised he could get back to it and manage, manage it fine, bringing up illustrations. By the way, the two people who are sitting on the bed talking to each other um, and uh, exchanging ideas are, are Dean Moriarty, that's Neil Cassidy, and, um, and Carlo Marx, that's Allen Ginsberg. So Ginsberg and Cassidy, and you can go look these folks up on Wikipedia, they're, standing, they're sitting on a bed looking straight at each other, exchanging ideas, attempting to, as was previously mentioned in the previous excerpt, uh, trying to uh, convince each other that they can be anything or do anything. They're trying to elevate their minds. The things that the hippies would do later on in the 1960s with the benefit of pot, uh, LSD, and a good shot of Janis Joplin. Back to the book, Carlos said, and just as we were crossing Wazi, I wanted to tell you about how I felt of your frenzy with the midgets. And it was just then, remember, that you pointed that old, you pointed out that old bum with the baggy pants and said, he looked just like your father. Yes, yes, of course, I remember. Not only that, but it started a train of my own, something real wild that I had to tell you. I'd forgotten about it. Now you just reminded me of it. And two new points were born. They hashed these over. Then Carlo asked Dean if he was honest and specifically if he was being honest with him in the bottom of his soul. Why are you bringing that up again? There's one last thing I want to know. But dear Sal, you're listening. You're sitting there. We'll ask Sal. What would he say? And I said, that last thing is what you can't get, Carlo. Nobody can get to that last thing. We keep on living in hopes of catching it once and for all. No, 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 no. You're talking about absolute bullshit and Wolfian romantic posh, said Carlo. And Dean said, I didn't mean that at all, but... We'll let Sal have his own mind. And in fact, don't you think, Carlo, there's a kind of dignity in the way he's sitting there and digging us. Crazy cat came all the way across the country. Old Sal won't tell. Old Sal won't tell. It isn't that I won't tell, I protested. I just don't know what you're both driving at or getting at. I know it's too much for anybody. Everything you say is negative. Then what is it you're trying to do? <laughs> tell him. No, you tell him. There's nothing to tell, I said and laughed. I had on Carlo's hat. I pulled it over my eyes. I want to sleep, I said. Poor Sal always wants to sleep. I kept quiet. They started in again. When you borrowed that nickel to make up the check for the chicken fried steaks. No, man, the chili. Remember the Texas star? I was mixing it with Tuesday. When you borrowed that nickel, you said, now listen, you said, Carlo, this is the last time I'll impose on you. As if, and really, you meant that I had agreed with you about no more imposing. No, 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 I didn't mean that. You hearken back now, hearken back now, if you will, my dear fellow, to the night Mary Lou was crying in the room, and when, turning to you and indicating my, by my extra added sincerity of tone, which we both knew was contrived, but had its intention, that is, by my play acting, I showed that, but wait, that isn't it. Of course that isn't it, because you forget that but I'll stop accusing you. Yes, this is what I said. And on and on into the night, they talked like this. At dawn, I looked up. They were tying up the last of the morning's matters. When I said to you that I had to sleep because of Mary Lou, that is seeing her this morning at 10, I didn't bring my preemptory tone to bear in regard to what you just said about the unnecessariness of sleep, but only, only mind you because of the fact that I absolutely simply purely and without any whatevers have to sleep now. I mean, man, my eyes are closing. They're red, hot, sore, tired, beat. Ah, oh, child, said Carla. We'll just have to sleep now. Let's stop the machine. You can't stop the machine, yelled Carlo at the top of his voice. <laughs> the first bird sang. Now when I raise my hand, said Dean, we'll stop talking. We'll both understand purely and without hassle that we are simply stop talking. And we'll just sleep. You can't stop the machine like that. Stop the machine, I said. Dell looked at me. He's been awake all this time listening. What were you thinking, Sal? I told them... I was thinking they were amazing maniacs and that I had spent the whole night listening to them like a man watching the mechanism of a watch that reached clear to the top of birth and pass and yet was made with the smallest works of the most delicate watch in the world. They smiled. 
I pointed my finger at them and said, if you keep this up, you'll both go crazy, but let me know what happens as you go along. I walked out and took a trolley to my apartment and Carlo Marx's paper mache mountains grew red as the great sun rose up from the eastward plains. Kerouac took risks, and he had the guts to take risks. And that's kind of the first point that I want to make of many, of three points today, actually four points today. Um, and we're going to round the curve a little bit here, but this is the first one. He had the courage to get out there and discover America, but he also had the courage to take risks. Um, risk was the relationships, identities, culture, and, and, and risks, most importantly, with the comfortable knowledge and pushing back against confirmation bias that has existed in human beings long before we were all gifted with accounts on the internet designed specifically to make us celebrities to our groups of about 10 people. Kerouac decided to get out there and discover America rather than just read about it. He's got a parallel here. A guy named Anthony Bourdain you may have heard of. Uh, author of a great book called Kitchen Confidential, which at some point, many years from now, we will cover on the podcast. And Bourdain was heir to Kerouac's legacy, and I think a lot, I thought a, a lot of Bourdain when I read On the Road. I think Kerouac would have appreciated what Bourdain was trying to do with No Reservations um, and with Kitchen Confidential um, and with the CNN show. I also think he would have not been surprised at all by Bourdain's death by suicide with no signs of violence. Interestingly enough, just as a side note, Kerouac, uh, not Kerouac, but uh, Bourdain was a uh, blue belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Bourdain took all this to a global level. He, he took this idea of connection to a global level because, quite frankly, in his lifetime, our problems became global rather than merely national and getting out there became a global pursuit um, and as a spiritual heir to Kerouac and Tone in writing a poach and, and even in drug use as a kitchen cook he would later claim that the only way you could get to know anything about anyone else's culture was by sitting down and having a meal with them by taking a risk on the most intimate thing that you can take a risk with somebody on one of the top three most intimate things you can take a risk with somebody on, and that's with their food. Ryan, leaders have to get out there, right? They have to get out there on risk. They have to get out there on a meal. They have to get out there on relationships. They have to maybe not get out there on risk, but they have to get out there to take a risk or take the risk to get out there. This requires a measure of courage. Um, where do they find that courage? Where... Where could we find that courage? And you've worked in kitchens, so you know Bourdain's experience probably resonates with you. And you've worked with those cooks. I'm sure you stood out back and had a couple of cigarettes with the, as he would have put it, <clears throat> the Mexican Americans who all cook our food, <laughs> who we don't acknowledge. Uh, maybe not so much nowadays, you know, in the backwash of COVID. Um, but capitalism does demand that the food get made somehow. So, where do we find the courage to take the risks? You've taken risks in your life. You're a poet. You're a musician. Um, you've done. You've done. You've done things. How do you find? How, how do leaders find that courage? So much like the book is broken into segments. My source of courage, although founded in a similar area and and that's so to comment on the it <clears throat> on the it <laughs> capital i capital t capital i capital t <laughs> i believe or my idea is that The it is an unidentifiable, inidentifiable, ideal 
ideals of every ghost in search of the it. Okay. So, and I understand what the driving force is, and I understand what the, I think it's, I think it's similar to, uh, 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 Emmett Fox, he did Sermon on the Mount, right? Yes. Yeah. So the the moment that you you, you uh, verbalize or say the word God, mm-hmm. yep. it loses meaning because you limit it to this uh, a, a series of sounds or one sound. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the Jews so, don't even. I mean, the Jews don't even. I mean, they don't. It's an unpronounceable word in Judaism. And so, yeah, so, and so that is the, it, and it's kind of like the essence. Mm-hmm. And uh, to make another parallel, in there's the great ones in uh, the book Stranger to Strange Land. Yes. Who just float amorphously. And they're, and so it's this thing, and it's, it's, I think it is all sort of serves the same purposes of like, uh, it could maybe be distilled into do unto others what you would have done unto yourself. Mm-hmm. That's sort of like the, the golden rule. And um, but having those, how do you find the courage? Yeah, how do you find the courage to find the golden rule? How do you find the courage to chase the essence? I mean, talk about Sermon of the Mount. Uh, the, the you know in Christianity that's known as the Beatitudes, and you know everybody goes, oh, the Beatitudes. That's so awesome. That's so easy. Jesus wasn't saying that was easy. Jesus was like, no, this is hard. It's hard. And by the way, let me lay out the hardness for you in very simple terms. Good luck. (laughs) And and I think it is curiosity. Okay. Is to uh, the, the courage... Well, when I was a much younger man and quote unquote invincible, there was a certain reality to my perceived invincibility. Mm-hmm. And that allowed me to uh, bypass mm-hmm. all uh, sort Good of like sense, well, bypass any fears. Yeah. Okay. That may have existed. Because fear is resistance, right? And it's it, it, it is uh, yeah that is synonymy. You can you can up, across all practices mm-hmm. that applies. Yeah, that's the Stephen Pressfield idea of you know, or 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 yeah, it's the Stephen Pressfield idea of the resistance. Yeah, yeah, get up. Yeah, it's 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 whatever BS that you are interjecting between you and the thing, Mm -hmm. the it that you are trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. So the courage initially it was uh, seeking and trying to figure out why. So the courage, the courage came from not wanting to experience the pain that I had experienced as a younger man, as Mm -hmm. a child. Right. And it's, and to like, there has to be, a different way to do this than what was shown to me, what was laid out before me, what was uh, expressed to me, what was, dare I say, tried to be taught to me. Mm-hmm. Um, because things didn't make good sense. Yeah. And so uh, pain is a wonderful motivator and uh, emotional pain especially and so for me to find the courage to do so well uh at one point it was um through masking my own pain and dealing with my own pain as is described with the uh the fitzgerald method or mm-hmm. the Hemingway the, the, the Hemingway, defense, method, the Hemingway defense yeah is okay i'm i'm going to bury and anesthetize myself with anything and everything. And this is where the invincibility comes in because I am quite sure that my daily intake for about 10 years would have killed just most people. Mm -hmm. But that's what I needed to do in the order. That is just to get through a day. So the Mm -hmm. courage to just get through a day took that. 
And then when that sort of ran out, I realized, and this goes to the uh, calling bullshit on the the, the uh, heavyweight defense, mm-hmm. is you don't. You don't. You remain curious. You yeah. realize that no one is going, I realized that no one was going to come get me. As long as I remain within the framework of, uh, I guess it would be mores. Mm-hmm. If I, the, the outline framework of society, if I remained in that space, mm-hmm. freedom in the sense of my body and mind had the opportunity to remain intact as long as some extraneous circumstance did not unfold. Yeah. But that's balancing on a that's balancing on a very thin line. And even if that thing did unfold, mm-hmm. and I'm saying accidents, you know, say it, that happen all of the time, you run over a family whatever and right. so now and so you know, uh, what's there's a, a I believe a book called Shantaram. Mm-hmm. Uh and it's about a gentleman who just uh, he's in prison in India. He's, a, he's, a, he's an American guy. And, you know, it was, and it, you know, this is, this is a, a common sort of thing. Like you in solitude or in isolation or in captivity or where that is where you have the moments of what we just, I said before about Chris, Christopher McCandless in the bus in Alaska. Oh my goodness gracious. I do not need this. It is understanding that you do not need the, you know, uh, the $5,000 Gibson in order to play great. You need the curiosity, the temerity, and the relentless pursuit of whatever it is. You, that will, that will get you to the next stage of searching does that and i want to kind of bring in another idea here which is kind of the second beat which is sort of where or the second idea where kerouac had the courage to write all this down um and of course he changed the names to protect the guilty (laughs) um but he wrote it down and perception there's a psychological idea. I don't want to go too deep into this, but there's a psychological idea that basically says human beings only achieve what they focus on and 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 that focus um, can only happen with an embodiment of awareness, right? So we tend to believe um, and the roboticists, the cybernetics folks, this is why they're having trouble doing AI, right? I read an article today, a, a panic article about how general AI is going to be built into robots and they're all going to take over the world. And, and I appreciate the people who are looking at things deeper than I am. If you're at MIT Technology Review, God bless you, you're looking at things deep, deep, more deeply than I am. I'm just some schmuck over here doing a literature podcast. Fine, cool. But I read your panic phraseology about how we're all going to die in a Terminator universe. And then I go over to psychology, and what psychology says is this. In order to have general artificial intelligence, you must have perception. The perception must be aware. Okay, that's two things we can program for. We can program for perception. We can program for awareness. Then it must have a third thing, which is a goal. And it must be focused on that goal. Now, the thing that human beings do sophisticatedly, the thing that Kerouac did sophisticatedly just in that one passage is, he demonstrated how human beings can have multiple foci focused on multiple goals, all layering in perception at the same time. And this is exactly what you're talking about. And then they make a decision about what to focus on out of all of the random data coming at them. And by the way, we do this faster than any supercomputer yet built. We just do. Even your most panicked AI quantum mechanics person will admit that. Matter of fact, I heard something, I read something years ago that to do the computing that requires per, that, that perception, awareness, to have the computing power that the human brain has that aligns perception, awareness, focus, and decision making towards a goal that a baby does 
you would need a quantum computer the size of Washington, D.C. to do. Now, I know things are getting smaller, so maybe it's only the size of, like, I don't know, Dubuque, Iowa or something now. <laughs> but you still need a giant computer to do it. What my baby used, my youngest son did. The just, like, and we're doing this all the time. This is why I don't worry about AI. This is why I don't worry about general intelligence. I don't worry about it. Um, what you're talking about in the pursuit of drugs to heighten that perception is what the hippies were doing in the 1960s. They wanted to heighten that perception. They wanted to open the doors of perception. This was all the LSD experiments. Um, this was um, the idea that uh, there will be an age of Aquarius. <laughs> we will all rise to a higher level of perception. Um, and they believed it. Now, we're not at a higher level of perception. We just have fancier tools. And so you talk about curiosity, temerity, and the relentless, I call it ruthless, pursuit of the next thing. That's the courage. But if my perception isn't laid out correctly, then it's a problem of perception. Which, of course, gets back to the drugs and gets back to confusion and gets back to a lack of clarity. And thus you become a ball of reactions that aren't really going anywhere. And I, I kind of walked you around a corner that's very complicated, but there's multiple ideas in there. And at the core of it, when people write down their experiences, they're seeking to get clarity on that, right? That entire ball of nonsense I just walked you through. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're seeking to get clarity on all of that because it is confusing if you're a human being. You're trying to figure out what to focus on and what to make a decision about. And there are no rules. The society just tells you make a decision about something. Your workplace tells you make a decision about something. Ryan, decide how to lead this person. Hayson, decide how to form this team. And then just walks away. And you're like, what? This is this is a I heard it I heard it one time compared to uh, a puzzle being thrown up in the air, a thousand piece puzzle being thrown up in the air, and you gotta catch all the pieces and put them together in the box at the same time. That's leadership. And it's just never gonna happen. <laughs> I so I worked for a company in Princeton, New Jersey, mm -hmm. a coffee shop and roaster called Small World Coffee. And the owners, they actually, they went to uh, Cornell Business School. Oh, okay. And, Cornell. I've and heard of that school. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a good school. It's over there. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> it's somewhere in Ithaca, I don't know. <laughs> and and uh, the owner, it was it was owned by uh, a, a divorced couple. They were married when they started it. They got divorced at some place, but and they worked together amicably, which is sort of impressive. But the uh, woman said one time, it's called Small World Coffee in Princeton, New Jersey on Nassau Street. It is amazing. I highly recommend everyone going there. Uh, and anyway, the, the, the owner was named Jessica. And, and, uh, and she said, you know, 100% when running a business is, it is not uh, selling yourself short to not want to attain that. Mm -hmm. And it's not a comment on, well, you don't have a, a realistic, well, why do you not think you 100% is realistic mm -hmm. and throw all of that out of the window. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because as you just said, a, a tenth, however many piece puzzle this, now, it's just not even probability. It's just, yeah, no, no. Hmm. It, it, there's it because there's personalities. Yeah. And so any personality can go in a, multitude of directions at any point. Mm -hmm. And so when you extrapolate upon that, then it becomes an impossible math problem. And so her opinion was, if we are functioning at 80% and we are, I mean, that is hitting on all cylinders. Yeah. And when you, when she put it in that terms, and I'm also like a king from playing baseball mm -hmm. and doing something, 40% of the time makes you the best that's ever played the game. Right. Yeah. Tony Gwynn, like. He I struck out, to... like, I think seven times one yeah. year. <laughs> 700 <laughs> at bats. He struck out seven or 14 times. 14 times. That. That's insane. And so, 
And, and yeah, it is, it is. And so it, it brings a, a couple of things. So you're talking about um, the, uh, the AI and all yeah. those things and using and having a, a, a sort of algorithm and that is venturing into the absurd as if there is a math equation that could uh, explain everything. And that I think is the beauty of it because otherwise life doesn't become something that is lived. It becomes something that is solved. Mm. And the beauty of this book is li I'm living it. I'm, it's a journey. It's a, this I'm seeking, I'm doing the thing. I'm not beholden to some sort of equation that is going to gift me uh, the right because, answer. The, 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 yeah. Because yeah. at that point it's not, is not happened upon. It is, you're not learning it. Right. And so then that makes me think of, there's a wonderful part in the movie Dogma mm -hmm. where Rufus played by Chris Rock is talking about uh, ideas and beliefs. And he, you know, in a sort of like paraphrasing, you know, uh, beliefs are dangerous. Uh, the, the wars are started over beliefs. Relationships are ended over beliefs. It's better to have ideas. So when you have an idea about something and then you pursue the idea and then it, it carries on from there, then you're not completely blindsided by this. Well, number one, by confirmation bias. Mm -hmm. And you're not blindsided when you're, you learn some information that is, uh, completely radical mm -hmm. and, and and beyond confirmation bias it's it's it is so radical it does not even enter the realm of possibilities with how your your your, your brain is it's like you could see there's and i know this has been debunked but you know what the bleep do we know there's a bunch of yeah. times where it's like or and this part actually isn't the, the quantum mechanics or the, so there's something that is in two places at the same time Yes. And the, 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 the scientist goes on to say, like, that you, when you're trying to explain that to someone, and this thing in reality, it really is in two places at the same time, you could say it to someone and they would be like, yeah, cool. And it's not that they think it is not amazing. It, most minds, all human minds, unless you have some backlog experience or, you know, data-driven research to understand why those things are two places. You, you, it's, it's like, yeah, you can slough it off as like just this sort of whimsical thing or something like that. Rather, the brain, you can't comprehend that there is this one thing is in two places at the exact same time. Mm -hmm. So it's not that you don't think it's like possible. It's just like, it is so completely radical and against how we perceive life on a daily basis that it, it's like, well, I'm not going to need to worry about two things at the same time. Like, mm -hmm. uh, and then the last thing I'm just thinking about sports. <laughs> I'm thinking about sports in the AI and those three components. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about, the game the other night where the Dallas Mavericks who are complete underdogs mm -hmm. against the best team in the NBA. Mm -hmm. And I've, and they, Luka Doncic had 27 points at halftime. Mm -hmm. The Phoenix Suns had 27 points at halftime. The mm -hmm. Phoenix Suns were the best team in the league all year. And so I'm thinking about one at a time. Uh, so there's 10 players in the court uh quarters are 12 minutes so what is every minute 20 seconds you replace a player on the court mm -hmm. with a robot mm -hmm. and how does that game turn out it becomes an emotionless it becomes a mathematical equation mm -hmm. yeah it becomes something that no one really wants to relate to mm-hmm sports the sports have been there's been a long 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 history of sports almost as soon as we crawled out of the cave mm -hmm. oh yeah or out of the ocean or, 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 or wherever or, yeah wherever <laughs> and so um you know and i do i'm gonna be honest i forget the initial 
question. That's okay. <laughs> That's all right. I, like I said, I walked you. I walked you around the corner. No, I, I. I think the issue is perception. I think fundamentally it is. I think it's. It's. We have to have our perception aligned, our awareness aligned. Uh, I think the Kerouac shows us that. In that piece there, where you have a conversation that goes on all night between Neil Cassidy and 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 Allen uh, Ginsberg, that I won't say it doesn't wind up anywhere. But the conversation has to stop because the goal is so far away. And it's 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 a goal of pursuing something that they actually, and this is why he put it in there, he actually talked about when they asked him um, about the soul piece. They were trying to get to something existential. They were trying to get to something higher. Uh, now, they were trying to get there with dexedrine and coffee and, and later with LSD. I, I keep going back to that. But this idea that there are higher levels of perception and that the highest level of perception, the highest uh, uh, ideal is the soul and that somehow we can get there to double back on what you were saying earlier from Jung about we're all human beings having a spiritual experience uh, trapped in this physical world, to paraphrase. We can't get there in the physical world. We can't get there from here. But the the thing that should excite us is not the fact or not yes, this should excite us, is the journey to that thing rather than have it depress us. And and that goes to something that you just mentioned, which is when we algorithmicize all of this, which is what we're rapidly doing because we do worship science now. We do idolize our iPhones. We idolize our iPhones. There are idols, and the things that come across them are our idols. Then that leads us into a weird sort of scientism where we're looking for the right answer that will solve the problem which is what a computer would do or rather, look, than, rather than follow the process. Or looking to people who, I mean, Elon Musk is a, a wonderful example. Yeah. Like, okay. All right. So, so now, okay. So you solve our problems. Right. Yep. And he's like, he, you know, it's, it's, it's like, <laughs> it's, it's like, uh, it, it's, it's so when, when uh, tricky is, you know, sort of seen as the the godfather of like trip hop, right? And he's like, I'm not, <laughs> dude. That's I don't know what that is. I don't know what trip hop is. I don't know. Like that was just a title that was thrown at me because of the music I make, and so it, it gets and the same thing like the Camus and mm -hmm. absurdism, and you can even like uh, I'm trying. Who's Alfred Jarry? Yeah. Who's uh, uh, uh? So he uh, there's a play. This is one of my favorite things ever. Mm -hmm. A play called Ubu Roy, the King Ubu. Okay. And it was performed one time. <laughs> once. And when it was performed, there was a riot in the city. Yes. There you because go. Because of how absurd it was. People could not comp they could not comprehend it to the degree that their only recourse was violence. Mm-hmm. So think, and it came from an idea and that is, and that expressed in the artistic realm. It wasn't an idea of like a religious right. conflict or it, no, it was. And so, um, just an idea in and of itself. And, and so when you, I think when you remove, uh, the, you know, the human quote unquote element or mm -hmm. the, 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 the the spirit, mm -hmm. then, like you're saying, you're getting into a, a really uh, a dangerous territory because I think the and and I, I I say this lightly the reality becomes indistinguishable from hmm. the created. Hmm. Or the curated, hmm. you know, hmm. uh, uh, metaverse. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're gonna leave that one for just a second because that yeah, can, that yeah, can yeah. pin that can pin. I, I've got mm, the metaverse. Oof. Yeah. Let's let's go. We can't even figure out the verse we're in right now. <laughs> exactly. Let's, let's worry about because I'll solve the problems in this one first before we anyway. Back to the book. Back to the book. <laughs> Back to the book. Back to Jack Kerouac and On the Road. I do want to say one more thing. So yeah. I think that is the importance of Kerouac being the observer. Right. Understanding his 
uh, whether it's self-appointed or, or whatever, the observer in that particular situation. And in a sense, he's like, I want to go to sleep. Right. Yeah. I want to, I want to be done observing. Yeah. Yeah. Now it was time for the Western threesome to find new living quarters in Manhattan proper. So this is part two of uh, Kerouac's On the Road. Uh, Kerouac has gone back home. Uh, there has been some time has passed. He's living with his um, with his aunt. Um, he's uh, attending uh, Columbia University, um, and uh, he is uh, not involved with uh, with any of the uh, any of the folks. Uh, they were all out west, uh, living their lives. And uh, f- years pass. You get the sense that years pass in between part one and part two. Um, but then they pick up to to Ryan's point. They pick up right where they uh, right where they left off. Um, now there had to have, there was a uh, there was a delivery that needed to be made, um, and uh, you know uh, they decided that they were going to be the people who were going to do it. Dean and Carlo and Ed Dunkel, um, and uh, and uh, at the time. Uh, Kerouac was still in New York City, and so they head they head east, right, to to pick up Kerouac, um, to uh, to pick up a uh, to pick up uh, some uh, some furniture for Kerouac's, uh, I believe it's Kerouac's aunt, and uh, get that back to uh, Massachusetts, right, where she was living at the time. And uh, the the thing that I want to hit on here with this section, well. I think you'll you'll see it. If not, we're, we'll we'll flesh it out a little bit here in on the road. Um, now it was time for the Western Threesome to find new living quarters in Manhattan proper. This is just after they dropped off the furniture to the aunt. We slept all day. Dean and I woke up as a great snowstorm ushered in New Year's Eve, nineteen forty-eight. Ed Dunkel was sitting on my easy chair, telling about the previous New Year's. I was in Chicago. I was broke. By the way, when I read that line, I, I underlined that in, in my copy, um, my Penguin copy of On the Road, which I'm showing right now on the video. Go out and get your copy. And I'll tell you something unique about this copy when I get to the end of uh, we get to the end of the podcast here. But when I when I read that line, I was in Chicago. I was broke. I thought of the William Shatner version of it hasn't happened yet, where he says uh, I was in Washington D.C. Strange cities, strangers were friends. Uh, it was winter, or it was New Year's, or it was Christmas, or something like that. I think it was Christmas. It was Christmas, and I was broke. So these are some some mimetic overlappings here between William Shatner, uh, Jack Kerouac. The Shat. <laughs> the Shat, that's right, the Shat. Who, by the way, went to space, interestingly enough, on a Blue Origin rocket. Not on an Elon Musk rocket. Back to the book. I was sitting at the window <laughs> out of my hotel room on North Clark Street, and the most delicious smell rose to my nostrils from the bakery downstairs. I didn't have a dime, but I went down and talked to the girl. She gave me bread and coffee cakes free. I went back to my room and ate them. I stayed in my room all night in Farmington, Utah, once where I went to work with Ed Wall. You know Ed Wall, the rancher's son in Denver. I was in my bed, and all of a sudden I saw my dead mother standing in the corner with light all around her. I said, Mother. She disappeared. I have visions all the time, said Ed Dunkel, nodding his head. What are you going to do about Galeta? Or Galatea, I'm sorry, Galatea. Oh, we'll see. When we get to New Orleans, don't you think so, huh? He was starting to turn on me as well for advice. One dean wasn't enough for him. But he was already in love with Galatea, pondering it. What are you going to do with yourself, Ed? I asked. I don't know, he said. I just go along. I dig life. He repeated it following Dean's line. He had no direction. He sat reminiscing about that night in Chicago and the hot coffee cakes in the lonely room. The snow whirled outside. A big party was hand was on hand in New York. We were all going. Dean packed his broken trunk, put it in a car, and we all took off for the big night. My aunt was happy with the thought that my brother would be visiting her the following week. She sat with her paper and waited for the midnight New Year's Eve broadcast from Times Square. We roared into New York, swerving on ice. I was never scared when Dean drove. He could handle a car under any circumstances. The radio had been fixed, and now he had wild bop to urge us along the night. I didn't know where this was all leading. I didn't care. Just about that time, a strange thing began to haunt me. It was this. I had forgotten something. There was a decision that I was about to make before Dean showed up, and now it was driven clear out of my mind but still hung on the tip of my mind's tongue. I kept snapping my fingers trying to remember it. I even mentioned it, and I couldn't even tell if it was a real decision, talking about perception, or just a thought I had forgotten. It haunted and flabbergasted me, made me sad. 
I had to do something with the Shrouded Traveler. Carlo, Marx, and I once sat down together, knee to knee in two chairs facing, and I told him a dream I had about a strange Ara Arabian figure that was pursuing me across a desert that I tried to avoid that finally overtook me just before I reached the protective city. Who is this? asked Carlo. We pondered it. I proposed it was myself wearing a shroud. That wasn't it. Something, someone, some spirit was pursuing all of us across the desert of life and was bound to catch us before we reached heaven. Naturally, now that I look back on it, this is only death. Death will overtake us before heaven. The one thing that we yearn for in our living days that makes us sigh and groan and undergo sweet nauseas of all kinds is the remembrance of some lost bliss that was probably experienced in the womb and can only be reproduced, though we hate to admit it, in death. But who wants to die? In the rush of events, I kept thinking about this in the back of my mind. I told it to Dean, and he instantly recognized it as the mere simple longing for pure death. And because we're all of us never in life again, he rightly would have nothing to do with it. And I agreed with him then. Kerouac influenced a whole lot of folks. Um, most notably the Doors, who infamously said that uh, no one makes it out of here alive. Interestingly enough. Um, but he also influenced the type of thinking that we now have in 2022 in America. Actually, we're, we're in the full flower of that thinking. And the flower, the, the petals on the rose are about, to, are about to fall off. They are falling off. And hopefully a new thing is blooming. Because the thing that Kerouac was talking about inside of that perspective on death was the spiritual aspect of the fatal materialism that began to infect post-World War II America. A fatal materialism that we all live in the backwash of and that leaders are leading in the backwash of. It is a fatal materialism of abundance. We have too much. And we are atop a burning oil derrick platform. And the problem is we keep pouring more gasoline on the fire. Now, if you're on top of a burning oil derrick, you have two options. You can either burn up or you can jump into the North Sea and save yourself. And the zeitgeist underneath Kerouac um, that he was documenting it on the road, the zeitgeist of the 1950s, was that sense of hovering on a decision, a decision on the tip of all of our collective mind's tongue. The America of the 1950s is often caricatured as a stultified, stilting cultural conformity uh, with corporate greed reined in, quote-unquote, by a powerful government. But this caricature is brought to you for the most part by the same people who aped Kerouac's writing and posture and, miss, and missed totally the appeal to individualism and American spirit he was making. The other darker thing that lurks under On the Road is the same thing that Yeats addressed in his poem, The Second Coming, in 1919, and that was documented in Joan Didion's book, Slouching Towards Bethlehem, in 1968, and that we're all living in the backwash of right now. Kerouac laid his finger on the sense of the entire 20th century, from geopolitical alignments and realignments to culture, had been one endless dynamic royal, creating a sense of uncertainty and anxiety that could not be battled back by drugs or alcohol or appeals to religion, sexual deviance, or even outright rebellion. Thus, as usual, we return to the wreckage that Nietzsche's proclamation of God's death brought to the West and its leaders as creepily and stealthily as acid on metal from the 19th century on down to now, when the rot is almost complete. I believe On the Road stands as a plea to put the fire out of the burning platform. I believe if you read it as a plea, you will get the message as a leader. He's not actually writing triumphantly about Dean and Neil and Herbert and the entire cast of characters. He's, he's writing tragically. This is a tragedy. It's a tragic memoir uh, because there seems to be no way out of the absurd, as Ryan has mentioned. And he couldn't find one. And I don't think, much like Nietzsche, I don't think he lived long enough to write out an answer to his question that he had for all of us. Ryan, thank you for coming on the podcast today. 
Thank you for taking your time to share your thoughts with us and your ideas, answer our questions, and wander through the gutters of my mind <laughs> and the backwater, the backwater alleys of my roads <laughs> and the wide America that's in my head. Do you um do you have anything you want to add today? Anything you want to promote today? Anything you want to talk about for the folks here at the end of the podcast if they've made it this far, which I think they probably have. This is probably our most existential podcast episode that we've done to date. But uh, if they've made it to the end, what would you like to tell the folks today? There is um, so one thing that. Evil cannot stand is forgiveness. <laughs> yes. And sometimes welcome and embrace the pain. Uh, and as you said before, you know, if uh, get to you know in the moment it may be terrible but if you if you persevere you'll get to another day and there's always sort of uh, infinite possibility um, on a uh, personal level mm -hmm. uh, my music I am I am in Cincinnati Ohio and uh, I work at Finley Market, which is one of the oldest markets in the country. Mm -hmm. And I, starting on June 7th, I will be hosting a uh, kind of a local artist music series. Mm -hmm. uh, every other Tuesday, starting on June 7th from 5 to 8, 5 to 7. And you can go to uh, music, uh, my music, which is the ghost who sells memories dot info. Uh, the ghost who sells memories dot info. Mm -hmm. uh, on there, you will uh, have access to a blog of mine, which is called the ghost who sells memories. And that is the ghost who sells memories dot com. And then um, both of those links will have access to a book I wrote in 2018 called Exploration After Death, a painting. And uh, a lot of what we spoke of mm -hmm. uh, today is uh, in there. And also, I think the influence of Kerouac uh, is in it's it, I think it's one of those things that um, kind of like Alice in Chains is one of the greatest bands of the 90s. Mm -hmm. Amazing, top to bottom, just incredible. Uh, the bands that Alice in Chains influenced are some of the worst <laughs> bands that you're ever going to listen to. So it's, uh, it, 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 you know, to be influenced by something and try to imitate something, this, that, it's better to, uh, you know, have the, and that is why, in my opinion, it is vital to, go out and experience and sort of like devour information mm -hmm. and see things and talk to people is because when you do that, when it becomes part of your kind of like daily uh, existence, it, it's like journaling or, or when it becomes uh, a second nature to behave that way, then all of those things are entering in your brain and coming out. If you were, uh, in your practice in ways that you are unaware of. So there is no, like, I am going to write a book that is like on the road by Jack Kerouac. Mm -hmm. No, you've been devouring, consuming all this information and conversations and experiencing all of these things to the degree that however, whatever's coming out of you is influenced by all of those things. Mm -hmm. And you're not copying or imitating. You're influenced by a panoply of, uh, visuals, conversations, words, music, sounds, uh, and those sorts of things. So that is kind of my, uh, my, that is, a, that is the thing that influences me to uh, go from living in New Jersey to Portland, Oregon, to Asheville, North Carolina, to back to New Jersey, to Cincinnati, and, and also, you know, date the wide range of, uh personality types and and uh 
size. You know, the whole thing. Oh, it's, it's very, I like them all, man. Like categories all. So, of individuals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's the whole thing. And so that's and so. Yeah, and you know, it's it's an honor to to you know to to be part of what Hasan has been creating, and and and, and uh, for the last and it must be what 10, 15 years. I mean, I could say forty three years. You could say forty three years. So, but but for the most part, it's it's like you know it, it you know it really started point, solidifying about fifteen yeah, years ago. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. at some point, yeah, the cake is, started coming together. There is, at some point there is this sort of uh, thing like oh wow everything that i've been doing in my entire life has been built towards this particular thing and it, mm. you know and 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 uh it's you know i'm a i'm a i'm a slow learner so but the but the 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 marble is uh being chiseled away and there might be some forms to things coming but you know art uh has uh, art is patient you know, love is patient. So that's, that's, I think that's what I would, would end it. And just thank you endlessly for the opportunity to come on and, and talk about these things and, and, uh, to find, uh, leadership, uh, possibilities and, and methods in, uh, on the road by Jack Kerouac is, uh, that is a beautiful thing. Awesome. We will have links to everything that Ryan has mentioned, including the non profit that he is raising funds for, uh, which he did not mention, but we will go ahead and we will put the link to that in the show notes as well. Uh, there is a very deserving young man. Who, Devin, Devin say, Corbett. Devin Corbett. Devin Corbett Sigma New Charity. Devin Corbett Sigma New Charity. And we will put the link to that in the show notes in the podcast. So please click on the Ghost of Sales Memories, uh, click on the Devin Corbett link, uh, go find Ryan's poetry, um, his books, his music. Uh, and if you are in Cleveland, if you happen to be in that part of, uh, of uh, I'm sorry, not Cleveland, Cincinnati. Uh, if you happen to be in Cincinnati, in, I, I don't know why I confuse those two, I, I shouldn't. But if you happen to be in Cincinnati, uh, or if you happen to be in uh, Northern Kentucky and you can get to Cincinnati, which mm -hmm. apparently you can quite well there in that part of the world, um, get on the road and go out and see what Ryan has to offer and use this opportunity to do what Ryan is suggesting and stay on the leadership path. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you. And all right. So Ryan is headed out <clears throat> to wherever it is he is about to roam. I think it's roaming back to being on the road. What can we take from Kerouac? Um, what can we add, right? We talk about a little bit, usually at the end of our podcast, we talk a little bit about staying on the path, right? Kerouac was a pioneer. Kerouac was a pioneer in his time. He was a pioneer in his writing. He was a pioneer in his work and just like all pioneers he had to be the first to go now that doesn't mean the first to go in travel writing as i mentioned before at the open uh there have been travel writers before that's not a new genre and anthony bourdain um was a global travel writer uh travel food writer but a global travel writer and so there will continue to be travel writers even on into the future but there's a template that gets set, and Kerouac was a pioneer of a particular kind of template. Yes, a drug-driven one, but a template nonetheless. A template driven by perception, awareness, self-awareness, but also a template driven by polish and clarity, uh, focus, and trying to discover the soul of something. So what can leaders do to stay on the path? What can leaders do to become more like Kerouac? How can they become more awake in their perceptions? Well, one of the things that I think we need to really mention here, and I think it would be bereft if we did not, is that Kerouac did not pull any punches. He didn't avoid any hard things. 
he documented what he had seen in the way that he had seen it. Did he edit? Did he curate? Did he aggregate? Sure, absolutely. He kept multiple journals, and there's been writing that has literally poured from the Kerouac pen long after his death, now that he has achieved popularity. And he has inspired creatives in all areas, from music and cinema to film, with the plethora of ideas that poured out of him. It was a real shame that he died early because what else would he have produced? Kerouac had courage. Leaders have to have courage. Kerouac had an unflinching eye and a clarity of vision, as do leaders who are good. Leaders who are good have a clarity of vision. Kerouac also acknowledged and was willing to face the darker truths. Um, in an America that was balanced on a razor's edge, and he was willing to pursue the spiritual explanations rather than the easy, fatally materialistic ones, or proto-social ones, or even political ones. Politics doesn't show up in On the Road, nor does it show up in Dharma Bums. And matter of fact, he was robustly anti-political. He was interviewed by William F. Buckley long after the hippies had co-opted his ideas, the ideas of the beat generation, and he had roundly rejected them. He wasn't interested in politics. He didn't believe that that was a solution to our spiritual problems, and he was right. Staying on the path requires accurately assessing with clarity and courage and a pioneering spirit the problem that needs to be solved, writing down the answer, and then ruthlessly pursuing that answer. That's how we stay on the path, and that's how we forge new paths, utilizing in aggregate all of the lessons and the writings that have come before us. So we have a few things here from HSCT Publishing home of the Leadership Lessons from the Great Books podcast. We have a few things here that'll help you stay on the path. And if you're watching this on YouTube, which you should be watching this on YouTube, uh, and if you've stuck around this long, you will see a couple of visuals for a couple of the resources that I want to mention. So, of course, we have the Leadership Lessons from the Great Books podcast and YouTube channel. You should subscribe to that. And, of course, we have the podcast. You should subscribe to that as well. You should also go rank us in iTunes, in Spotify, and on Google Podcasts. Give us a ranking. Five stars, four stars, three stars, two stars, however many stars you want to give us. If you like the show, if you don't like the show, if you're mediocre about the show, go and rank us. Go and like us. Go and tell other folks about the show. That's how we spread. That's how the message gets out. That's how we grow. And we are growing. Our downloads are increasing with every single episode, and we like to keep that momentum moving forward. We also have an email list, so if you'd like to be added to that, you can always email me, podcast, uh, Leadership Lessons from the Great Books, that would be in the subject line, uh, CEO at hsconsultingandtraining.com. That's CEO at hsconsultingandtraining.com, and I'll get you on the list. Subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can get our videos of these podcasts every Friday of every week. We read one major book a week, and we're putting up one video a week on the HSCT Publishing YouTube channel, so you should go and subscribe to that. Now, there are other ways to stay on the path. Our products and services can help you do that, so... We have our Leadership Toolbox product, which is 12 workshops, remotely or in person, delivered that are designed to help your managers and supervisors, or you as a manager and supervisor, stay on the path. Stay on the path to leadership, stay on the path to greatness. If your organization would be interested in buying those or having us come in and doing some consulting and coaching, uh, go ahead and check us out at leadershiptoolbox.us. We have our Leading Keys platform, which is our software as a service subscription only platform with asynchronous content. We have uh, 60 uh, videos there with asynchronous content designed to help you become a better leader. We also have a coaching forum where you can ask us questions and we answer them live. It's kind of like listening to this podcast and getting coaching from me without having to listen to this podcast to get coaching from me. <laughs> so go check us out at leadingkeys.com. Finally, if you don't want to go do a platform thing and you don't really want to talk to your boss about doing the training thing, we have our books. So we just released in paperback and in hardcover, and I'm holding them up and showing them 
on video right now. This is why you should be watching us on the YouTube channel. So we have our new book, my new book, 12 Rules for Leaders, The Foundation of Intentional Leadership, uh, written with contributions from Bradley Madikin. This is the book right now for the time in which we are living right now, when innocuous leaders such as yourself, who believe that the decisions that you make don't have much of an impact, well, this is the book to teach you that you do have an impact. And it's to show you the 12 areas where you could have the most impact on your teams, on your culture, and on your organization so that you can survive and be on the road in the 21st century, which is going to be, if the last 22 years have proven any indication, is going to be over the next the next few years just as chaotic as the last few years were. And clear-eyed pioneering leadership from innocuous people is what is going to be required for us to get through all of this together. So go check out 12 Rules for Leaders in hardcover, in paperback, and in Kindle version on Amazon.com. You can also order it through Barnes & Noble, and you can get it on the Barnes & Noble Nook or any other major book retailer. And of course, listen to our shorts episodes where we will be covering uh, in summary, each one of the 12 rules for leaders that we talk about in the book over the next couple of months on this podcast. All right, that's how you stay on the path. And that's really all I have today. So from Leadership Lessons from the Great Books, my name is Hayes Sorrells. Out.